Right, so first of all, thank you. Um, and I appreciate FEI and uh, FEI leadership inviting me to, to present this evening. I'm presenting on a, a subject that I am personally extremely passionate about um, because it's all about you. And it's about the people in this room and how you are going to have the relationships that are necessary to not only have a job, but have a job that you love. And the job that you love will typically come working with people that you really respect and appreciate and enjoy being around. And the way to get to that is through building a great, great relationships and finding the time to build great relationships. So I've been involved in FBI for probably close to about 10 years in different ways. <clears throat> Since I joined Baker Tilly three years ago, I've gotten much, much more involved in the sponsor of the firm. <clears throat> I joined the firm to run an interim um, project consulting practice as part of our search and staffing practice at the firm <coughs> for about 20 years. Um, I've done that for a long time after leaving Accenture. However, <clears throat> one of the things that I saw as a, a, a challenge in those types of models is you're not backing people up with additional knowledge and it really, it becomes a certain type of, of uh, uh, sale, if you will, where you're trying to sell something rather than always trying to create value. So in joining Baker Tilly, it really allowed me to deliver on my promise, which is really being here for all of you. And I often say, Krista Caprini sitting here in a, in, here with us, sorry to call you out, Krista, but Krista actually is a permanent recruiter with our firm, and she's heard me say often, I don't care if I place you, but I do care that you get to where you want to be. And that's a mentality that, that you know, we bring, while we do place people, and that's part of what we do for a living, the relationships that we have are much more. Baker Tilly is a large CPA firm. We do everything that a large CPA firm would do, and also the interim permanent placement and um, retained search as well. So what we're here to talk about today is building uh, life relationships by being all in. And this evolved out of a meeting that we had with the FEI engagement committee, where we were talking about how to get people to commit, not to commit, but to be more engaged in their involvement with FBI. And what we realized is that what FBI is to people really kind of has changed and needs to change. So we'll talk a little bit about that today, which is why, besides being building relationships by being all in, I'm calling this affectionately the road to FBI. How do you work with FBI to get something out of this professionally as well as personally? So that's what today's about. <clears throat> so first of all, think about why you joined FBI, what can and what FEI should be to each member. And I'd like to make this even broader around what should your network really be going forward. So we'll talk about that. Um, what can you get out of your involvement with FEI both today and long into the future? Um, FEI is not a transaction. Networking is not a transaction. Networking is really a way of life. And I presented a version of this, thanks to Vince Dorado, at um, the Career Management Group, a morning breakfast that takes place the first Thursday of every month. That's correct. Um, out in Rosemont, and this was called Networking for Life. So really, this is about how do you build your life, your professional and personal life through networking and, get, and, and make it even that much more rewarding. Um, you certainly get out of it what you put into it. Um, it's like anything, but that really is the case here. Um, today's marketplace requires you as professionals and FEI as an organization to really look at things through a different lens, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, FEI could be a great networking platform, however, it is much easier if you're all in. And I'm, I'm going to stop here and mention, I do not want this to be a presentation. So if, if you have any thoughts, you know, raise your hand, call out, I don't care. But I, I want this to be as interactive as possible, um, because I think that's the way we're all going to get something out of it. There will be time at the end for a little activity, and then, um, and then some, uh, some question and answer and such. Um, so let's talk about the landscape for the senior financial and accounting professionals today. I think we all know anecdotally that this has changed. If you think back to kind of what it may have been 10, 15 years ago, people would be in a CFO C-level seat for 10 or more years. That's going away. And it's still, the root Rotary Camp has been with Boeing for a while, you know, and that still exists, but it, those opportunities are fewer and farther between. So, um, you know, it's more like you know, four, four and a half years or so that people are gonna be in a role. So that has completely changed the way that we all have to operate in our careers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so again, this means the majority of people in this room will have at least one more job, possibly two or three more jobs. And when you think about what it is and what it feels like to interview for a job with people that you've never met before, it's kind of an artificial experience. You know, you're sitting there trying to put your best foot forward. They're sitting there trying to, trying to ask you the right questions to determine whether you're the person you know, they kind of want to get married to in some ways. And um, you know, having a network of, of others that you can call and you can bounce ideas off of. Before I took the role at Baker Tilly, I got in touch with Skip Newman and Gary Parks, people that people in this room probably know. 
And I, uh, these are people that I met through FEI and built real relationships with. And I asked them, tell me about this from FEI. Is it a firm that really I would do well in? Not do I have the right skill sets, but is Aaron Brooks as a human being going to do well with these other human beings? Because at the end of the day, all our firm is is a talent firm. So if we're not all operating in concert with one another, then we're probably not going to be able to create the value that we could potentially create. So it was very important to me at this point in my career that I wasn't just doing something that I loved, but that I was doing it with people that I really appreciated and enjoyed. So I got that opportunity, the opportunity to make those phone calls out of my involvement here. Um, FBI should and could become your go-to network for career support as well as for support, support from, your careers, or from your peers while networking, or while working, I should say. So if you're sitting in a role and you're a CFO and you come up with a tax issue that your company has never seen before, it's very possible for you to pick up the phone and call one of your friends that you meet in FEI and ask how, how they've dealt with that kind of type of thing. So there's that support, but there's also the support from the perspective of you get tapped on the shoulder, you know, unfortunately we've had a bad quarter, we're managing things by spreadsheets and sorry, we love you, but you gotta go. FEI is a great place to turn to, to your friends and, and, and associates at FEI and say, who do you know, what are you hearing? And, and, and you know, how could you potentially help me and how could I potentially help you? Um, so must network and work to avail themselves of the best career opportunities. So let's get into this. What is networking? How is it defined and how should it be defined? Why network in the first place? What do you get out of networking with an FEI? How do you differentiate yourself from the network? We'll talk about that. It's very important to differentiate. And we'll talk about a book that I'm really into as it relates to that. Um, so what do you represent? What is your personal brand? And by the way, differentiation is not that you did a better analysis than the other guy. Because anybody that's in a room looking good at, that's interviewing, their resume has said that they have the right skill set to be in that room. So they're probably not making the decision based on a technical skill set. They're probably making the decision more subconsciously based on other things. And we can talk a little bit about that. Um, so what is the process? One of the things I notice is a lot of people tell people the network, but then they don't talk about the process, and it is a process. Everybody in this room probably understands the process, so we'll talk about what that process could look like. Um, how do you leverage a network built with in transition once you land, and how can your effort in FEI membership help? It's very important to continue networking once you land. And I'll get to this later, but everybody here is in sales, whether you realize it or not, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the difference between contacts and relationships. Um, LinkedIn has created, LinkedIn is wonderful, however, it's not so wonderful, because it's created a lot of people thinking that they have relationships when they really have contacts. So I challenge all of you to go look at your LinkedIn membership and your contacts and say, who of these people do I really know? And who of these people, if I called them, would they call me back? And then ask yourself, what have I done for my LinkedIn network? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, all right, so my background, et cetera, I was four years in financial strategy consulting. I worked in multiple publicly traded <coughs> project consulting firms that, to be honest with you, are really staffing firms. Um, Baker Tilly, my role is kind of changing right now at Baker Tilly. I joined to run this interim practice in Baker Tilly. I've been selling for the entire firm since I joined. So a couple of weeks ago, they came and said, why don't you just report into Baker Tilly itself, the, the, uh, business development for the firm, and we're kind of defining over the next few months what that role is going to look like. Um, then I have a wife that I adore, three kids. I live up in Highland Park. I have a little retriever. Um, it's very important. Anyway, okay, so why do people join FEI and how has this changed? Historically, FEI has been a great place for, you know, Chicago CFOs, manufacturing CFOs to get together, talk shop, maintain CP credits. And as Terry said, you know, this is a place where you can get much more out of it than you can. What I've watched from a dynamics perspective is people get involved in FEI sometimes when they're in transition or think they're going to be in transition soon, and then they disappear once they get a job. And that is a dangerous way to run one's career. Um, uh, so uh, people join FEI for many reasons. Given the dynamics of today's marketplace, we want FEI to be more to our members from a, a personal career perspective, so a two-tier relationship. So what that basically means is you can have a relationship with FEI based on maintaining CP credits, coming, to, coming in and hearing about how to do, last year there was a presentation on web filings. And all these things are interesting, but they're not as personal to anybody in this room as your other responsibility, which is to create value for yourself and your family. So this is an organization where you can develop great friendships of people that will support you through this and through your career so you can ensure you're taking the right roles with the right people and um, it becomes a heck of a lot more fun as well. One of the things I'm going to talk about later is a 
a couple of examples of people whose FEI membership has really taken them to some pretty significant places. Um, so this presentation will provide you with some tools and processes you can utilize to navigate, build great relationships, and put this involvement here, as well as other networking, really to work for yourself. Um, and again, you get, get out of it when you put into it. You can't say that enough. So let's talk about Webster's definition of networking. Supportive system of sharing information and services among individuals and groups having a common interest. I agree with that. Second piece I don't necessarily agree with, to cultivate people who can help be helpful to one professionally, especially in finding employment or moving to a higher position. That, to me, is about me and not about the other end. So networking has got to be about the other end. And when I sit down with people, I'll often ask them, tell me about your conversations you have with people. And what they say, oh, ask if they know anybody they can introduce me to and such. And that all sounds great. And then I'll say, who have you introduced? I don't do much of that. Sometimes I do, but I... forget about the first piece, do the second piece, and be a connector. And the more you're a connector, the more people will connect you. Um, so let's talk about the Aaron Brooks definition of networking. Um, selflessly helping others with whom one shares a common interest or bond with the understanding that assistance provided today will continue to make the entire network stronger in the long run. Looking to give value um, to other people through quality introductions and sincerely unselfish behavior, and that key word is sincerely, uh, with a trust that uh, value will come back to those that stay true to their networking partners over time. And I'll never forget, I'll mention Skip Newman, he's not here, I think he's interviewing people for the college night, but I'll never forget the first time I met Skip Newman at a career management meeting. We then had dinner with our wives, we talked about business, he's helped me out personally and professionally, and that's all relationships that came from not in this room, literally, but right in this room. Um, so FBI is an organization of givers, <clears throat> my favorite book. Um, Adam Grant should send me a check. Um, I, I've done a lot of evangelizing about the book Give and Take. Has anybody read the book Give and Take? Heard about it? Um, so what do you, Chad, Chad who is a very good networker and has written a book about networking. What do you know about the book? Like, anything? I studied the book. What's Read that? the book. Listen to the book. It's a phenomenal book. You might owe me a bigger check. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I have a feeling, okay. So, so I talk about this book every single day because one of the things that I do, I spend a lot of time with executives in transition trying to help them to get to where they want to be. And when you think about it, there are takers, there are matchers, and there's givers. Now, you've probably either consciously or subconsciously thought about takers and givers. You probably haven't thought about matchers. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Takers like to take more than they give. If you think about Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling and Enron, hopefully they don't do that with these guys. Anyway, um, they were clearly takers. But if you had told them they were takers, they'd say, what do you mean? I have a charitable foundation. My, my family gives to charity. How can you say I'm a taker? But if you think about their, their behaviors, in their company, they were all about them. It was about the stock price, it was about how they were all going to make more money, and they created a culture of takers. And we all saw what happened. Okay? Matching is what we're probably trained to do in business most of the time. And that's the, I'll do for you if you do for me, but I'm not sure if I trust you yet, so why don't you do for me first? And this is the dance that often happens um, between people, between companies, and vendors. And I hate the word vendor, I'm a partner, but you earn the right to be a vendor and you earn the right to be a friend, but when you're, when you're networking in more, a more mercenary way, you're gonna get, again, you're gonna get out of it exactly what you're gonna do. Giving is who we all are at home, and this is actually interesting, because when I read the book, I used to say to my wife, you know, because I worked in some places where I wasn't really able to be myself. I had to go to work and become a matcher or a taker, and it didn't feel good. And I used to say, I remember one particular vacation I was out with my wife where I was kind of lamenting some of this stuff, and I said, you know, It'd be great if I could be the same person I am with my friends when I go to work, and I'm not able to do that. It's not fun. And then I found Baker Tilly, and it's, it's been phenomenal from the perspective of the, the viability to be the giver that I want to be amongst other givers where we can create uncommon value together. It's just, it's phenomenal. And I, that's, if I'm passionate about anything, I'm passionate about helping everybody in this room to find the same thing that I'm doing. <laughs> um, so ask yourself, are you a giver, taker, or a matcher? Um, and are you different in your personal life than you are in your professional life? And that's something you can only look in the mirror and figure that out yourself. But it's something that I really, I really think everybody should be, should be thinking a lot about. All right, so the process. Um, attend meetings regularly, meet people, exchange information, and follow up outside of FBI. That's probably obvious. We'll talk more about that. Try to get involved in your employees. If you are getting involved when you are in transition, stay involved. And look to assist your peers once you land, it will come back to you. This is all obvious stuff. Think about what you have to give. 
Who do you know that can be helpful to your fellow members? A lot of people when they're in transition, they don't think they have anything to give. I need something right now. I don't need to give. And then I say, do you know anybody? They say, sure. I say, okay. Now, let, let me ask you a question. Um, how many in this room have a personal network? I hope everybody does. How many have a professional network? And my suggestion after today is to bring those networks together and think of them as one. So if there's somebody in your personal network that needs to meet somebody in your professional network, either whether it's because you think they'll get along, whether you think it's because you think their kids will get along, or whether you think they'll be able to help one another professionally, make that introduction. Um, when I presented this at the last career management meeting, I asked the question, would anybody in this room, if, if I said, if you were working as a CFO or a controller or something that, that it is that you do, and I sent you a great, well thought out introduction to another professional in the marketplace, would everybody here appreciate that introduction? So the question is, why don't people do more of that? And that's, that's what I'm suggesting out of this presentation, is that you really think about being that connector even though you're a financial person that's expected to deliver value financially for your firm, for your company, the connecting piece is really where life becomes pretty, actually a lot of fun. Um, so uh, everybody appreciates a quality introduction, provide quality introductions to your peers, and be complimentary when doing it. One thing that I do not suggest when you network is to say, I'll send you a little blurb that you can send out when you're introducing me. Don't make it that easy for me. People should, when you're networking with somebody, they should be listening to what you have to say. They should be picking up on what differentiates you so that when they make that introduction, they can, they can present you through their own eyes. Um, and what will happen is, when you make that introduction and it's sincere, you're sincerely complimentary, people are going to think, God, what a nice thing this person said to me. I should introduce them to this person. And what will wind up happening, and I was actually having a conversation uh, with somebody today about this, what will wind up happening is that will become your roadmap to the time that you're in transition because all of those introductions will lead to introductions for you which then creates your what you should be doing and I tell people when they're in transition they should be meeting with eight to ten people a week easily people look at me like I'm crazy how's that going to happen well this is how it happens um, all right, so differentiate yourself blue ocean strategy um, anybody ever read the book blue ocean strategy so you want to tell a little bit about it I don't mean to put you on the spot. But. No, yeah, it's fine. I mean, I mean uh, so when you're out there competing uh, against you know, other companies that have the same strategy as you, it's called the red ocean because you're just fighting for all the blood in the water. So the goal is to come up with, like the example they use in the book, is Surface Soleil, where they exactly. found a new market and created a blue ocean where there are no competitors. We don't really know each other. Well, we're following the too. Yeah, so. okay, good. That's perfect. So yeah, it's exactly right. If anybody's ever seen Surface Soleil in a tent, as opposed to Ringley Brothers, well, is circus really a circus? Is it a Broadway show? It's really neither of them. But the cost of running their show is much less when they set up in the parking lot of the United Center rather than the inside. They don't have animals, they don't have stars. So their, their costs are much less, but they turn to theater type price and nobody questions it because they don't have any competition. So the question is not how are you gonna differentiate your business model, that's important, but everybody in this room needs to think of themselves as a blue ocean. What differentiates you from the others? So as an example, um, anybody ever here ever heard of the, uh, I'm not, it's not going to be a quiz, but anybody ever heard of Association of Financial Professionals, the AFP? Uh, they created the Certified Treasury Professional designation. A couple of years ago, maybe five or six years ago, they created a designation for fp and professionals. Now, why does that matter to anybody in this room? I don't probably, well, maybe there's a couple of people that might want to get that type of designation. But it's more important to be aware of that designation so that when you go into an interview, if you're interviewing with a board member and you're talking about what's changed in the marketplace, you're able to say, you know, I'm sure you're meeting with a lot of people that probably look like me on paper, but let's talk about what's going on in the macro environment and let's talk about how FP&A has changed. And you may be aware of the fact that there's a new designation for FP&A professionals. I didn't even know that. Wow, that's really interesting. Tell me more about that. Now you're having a conversation and you're telling that person you know about the macro environment, you understand what it is to hire people and keep them <coughs> excited about their job because maybe you invest in creating this, you know, in, in having one person get this designation and bring those learning back to the organization. But you want to differentiate yourself around something other than I could do a great analysis through it. Um, so that's just an example of how you can be and think about yourself as a blue ocean. So again, what is your personal brand? something you need to think about in your network of relationships could potentially your differentiate, be your differentiator. So again, context versus real relationships and the fact that get out of the computer, get out of LinkedIn, 
and get out there and meet people. I tell people when they're in transition that um, uh, to kind of think about their life as a football field, and you, you're at one end of the field, the other end of the football field is the job, and your job is to move the ball down the field a bit each day, and the way to do that is to be meeting with people. If you're doing stuff online, you don't get any yards. Um, sorry, but you know. Um, so, five-minute favor. This is from Give and Take. I think this is perfect for FBI. There is no gesture that is too small and done with gratitude over Winfrey. Okay. Um, anyway, being willing to selfless and do anything for anybody that takes five minutes or less. And it can really be life-changing. And that is just, it's, it's as obvious as I could possibly say. So again, introduce two people with a well-written email. We talked about being sincere. Serve as a relevant reference. Go on LinkedIn for people that have you worked with in the past and put a recommendation out there that they didn't even ask you for. People will be blown away by that. I mean, and people don't do it, so it, it's not a bad idea to do that. Um, uh, and have something differentiated to offer your network in the marketplace. And again, that is, it comes down to relationships. Um, this is just obvious stuff. Always be networking, attend FBI, collect business cards, offer to help, and, and lead with information about yourself. Talk about your family, your life, your career, your dog, your, whatever you're passionate about. Because what you'll find is other people will start to open up to you as well, and it will become more of a relationship rather than a kind of a cold conversation. Um, and that, by the way, requires the next thing, which is um, you know meeting in person. A lot of people say, oh, I'll call you, we'll talk over the phone. I'd really rather meet you in person. I'm happy to come to you. But let's get together and really meet and get to know one another. Um, be the same person in your business relationship as you are in your personal relationship. Bring your networks together. Um, and again, you will be perceived differently when in your transition as opposed to when you're working, so stay involved when you land. Um, there are, are great examples of people that have stayed involved in this organization that, that have really um, exploded their careers. And I would probably say, I mean, you have to have the technical know-how, but you also have the relationships that will get you to the place to deliver the technical know-how. Um, power of dormant relationships. There are people that I haven't talked to in three years that I call them up and they're right there in front. So you cannot talk to somebody for a couple years, but as long as you behave in these ways, what I found, at least in my experiences, those people will always be there for you. But people are going to know whether you're on their team or whether you're truly on, on your team. Um, again, this is all, again, pretty kind of redundant. Uh, more quality and sincere introductions you provide, the more your network of real relationships will grow. Suddenly, your network will become really powerful and you won't even realize it. So here's the thing. This is not a transaction and it doesn't happen immediately. Like Terry was saying, this is the, you are constantly investing in the stock that is yourself. Every conversation you have, every introduction you make is an additional investment. And at one point you'll wake up and you'll say, oh my God, like, my network is huge and these are all great friends and I've really, you know, we all look back at our careers. I don't know how all of you feel, but I will probably remember some of the cool technical stuff I did, but I think I'll remember the relationships and the people I work with a lot more. So, um, Anyway, um, oops. Oops. Right. so um, the, your network will be more important as you move up through your career. This is something that a lot of people don't realize until they wind up getting tapped on the shoulder and wind up in friendship. Because what happens is you get to that point in your career and you network internally and you've been working for a big company and something, and all of a sudden you're thrown into the water and it's what do I do? You know. Um, so I, I made the mistake when I was at Accenture, I networked internally extensively. I thought, hey, you need to come to Anderson Consulting, attach yourself to a great partner, they take you along and you wind up making a million bucks. That didn't work out. So, <laughs> um, it didn't. so I, I mean, I, I, 2001, 2002, right in that time frame, there was a lot, not a lot of work in Chicago, and it was there and hey, see, it's time to leave. And I'm like, oh my God, I have no network. What do I do? And so I swore to myself I was never going to make that same mistake. Now, in some ways, I network for a living, I'm in business development. What I tell people is I get to know them is, look, you're a CFO, you're a controller, I'll network on your behalf. I will meet people that it makes sense for you to know, and then I will network them to you. And that's a real partnership. That's a real mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and again, we are all in sales. We all sell our time for a living. And what people do, this is really important, people land in a job, and they effectively stop building a pipeline of relationships through which they can sell their skills. Again, it, it, this, is all, it, this is all the same theme that I'm talking about, so I apologize if I'm being redundant, but that's how passionate I am about it. Um, and by the way, out of this conversation, I'm more than happy to get together with any of you that want to, some of you folks I already have gotten together with, um, and talk about this what, mean, what this means to you as individuals, because each of us are different and looking for different things. All right, so, a couple of examples. 
Everybody here know Otis? I'm going to embarrass Otis, even though it's not the room. I'm so glad he'd be in the room for this. Um, actually, this is an embarrassing. This is a wonderful thing. Otis got involved in FBI and um, met Jim Patterson through FBI. Everybody here know Jim? Or some people know Jim. Uh, Jim is now CFO of PLS Financial. I met Jim when he was in transition after he left Shock. And uh, I helped him to network a bit. I was also kind of in a, a bit of flux trying to figure out where I belonged in, in the marketplace as well. I was at a different firm at the time. And um, so Otis and, and uh, Jim met through FBI, and then Jim needed to hire a VP of Finance. So Otis went and interviewed for the role. And he wanted to get in the role, not because of his involvement with FBI, but because he had the right skill set to do the role. But let's face it, if he didn't know Jim, maybe Jim would have hired somebody else because there wouldn't have been a relationship there. Um, so Otis then landed in that role. It's been a really solid role for Otis. He kept, in, kept state involved in FBI. He's now president of FBI in Chicago. So that is a great story of, you know, as Otis, if Otis stays at PLS, great. He decides to move on. Well, now on his resume, is he's president of FBI in Chicago. So that all happened because he stayed involved. And then Yolanda Daniel, who was hoping to be here, and she's not here. She, Yolanda is somebody that I met when she was director of, this is, I'm sorry, director of internal audit at Caremont years ago. And I explained to her why networking was important, how she should network. She's gotten involved in different things, and then she just landed a CFO role, and I said, I've been it, she said, networking. So anyway, it's, it's really important. Now this challenge thing, and I'm not gonna do this here, but what I'm gonna ask each of you to do tonight is find somebody, or two people, or five people, whatever order of magnitude you're comfortable with, that you've never met before. Meet them, exchange business cards, get together for coffee, Talk about your families, get to know each other as real people, and then get back to me and tell me how it worked out. Because I'm um, so I, th that's what I got. Um, any thoughts, questions? Yeah, I'd love to have kind of conversation. But I mean, do people think this makes sense? Um, so who wants who wants to kind of kick off a quick sure, can you? One thing I'd like to add. Um, actually, I got my last role through networking, so um, I I knew a guy in Chicago who was in that and Tucker Development, and mm -hmm. Well, we should talk about that because they're not on the uh, Yeah, I used to work for Tucker for 10 years. I, was in, I worked in a development role at uh, Tucker as controller, and it was ground up uh, grocery store and quick strip. And now I work uh, with the, the guy who did leasing for Tucker at a place in Northbrook, which is five minutes from my house. And I, I work for a company that owns uh, three regional shopping centers and other companies. So all food networks. And keeping the, the contact. Very Absolutely. And you were also president of FBI. Yes, two, uh, two years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's a um, different world we live in. You know, it's not just about getting a job. And let me tell you, it's a lot more fun, too. Um, anybody else? I hope this is helpful. The only other comment I'd like to make about FBI is um, it's really important once you get, uh, once you become a member, to think about joining a committee. We, we have a lot of committees. Um, we stay very active with Susan, helping us uh, organize and, and plan all these great events. And we have a lot of committees, that, and being involved in the committee um, activates the facial recognition a little bit more so than either just attending a couple of events here. It's a great, I, I use my FBI membership um, to come to the social events every year. Um, the, uh, the, we have casino night coming up, we also have a winter social. So I use my membership to kind of fill my social calendar as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a great thing. You know, one thing I forgot to mention, none of us need referral sources. It's not what you need. Because there's like, it's like a wall. We all need great friends. And, and I mean, that's just, and Chad, I mean, go ahead, because I know you did, Chad is really good at this stuff, so. Well, I would just observe that there's, in this room, uh, four or five or six really, really big givers who, will be willing to give you of their network before you give them what you have. But I would ask, because I know that all of you are really confident in this room, if you're not comfortable networking, and this might be one of your first events, raise your hand. Everyone here is an expert, Aaron, so therefore, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so if you are uncomfortable, you, you have extremely talented givers, and if there's something in this room that you would like from one of us, Please feel free to ask and um, try to end it with, hey, what can I do for you as a worst case scenario. Uh, another case scenario would be to get $5 gift cards to Starbucks and you hand them out. 
for people like me and Aaron. And <laughs> thank you for potentially giving you and helping you connect to your next job. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because, you know, the typical uh, financial person, it, it, you know, these are muscles that maybe you've never flexed before. I mean, I, this is what I do. I mean, I grew up acting, I grew up singing, I and mean, that's what I do. Right? It's just who I am. Um, that's not who a lot of people are, and that's okay. I love nothing more than sitting down with people that are maybe a little bit uncomfortable that kind of come under their shell, and, and then suddenly it's like, God, this is great. Like, I've really gotten to know some great people through this. Um, Ron Root is a good friend of mine. Ron's not here today, but Ron, um, I met Ron when he was in transition. He was a uh, CFO of the Division of Exxon. He then landed at Fonterra Dairy. We did some business together. We got to know each other. And Ron has enjoyed networking and helping people so much. He's like, you know what? I don't want to be a CFO anymore. I think I'm going to be a professional coach. He's doing a great job at it. So you never know where any of this stuff is going to land. But again, please ask and please, you know, people like Jim Miranda, who's been networking for a long time and knows a ton of people and speaking great, but I know you'll be willing to help people in the room. I mean, there's some really, really great people in, in this organization, and um, you know, I'm happy to help you to figure out who those people are, and then we're just all of our votes are going to rise together, and that's really what this is all about. So, yeah, Terry. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about once you have the meeting, what's the best way to hold the conversation that you're in the first network? Sure. All right. So the, the best way to me, even when I meet with clients that think I'm there to sell them something, I always walk out of that meeting know where they, knowing where they grew up, if they have kids, where they're from, what they do when they're outside of work. Um, I, I, I have a anecdote. I'm sorry. I have a story to tell about all these things. A couple years, three years or so ago, I had lunch with Tom Minichello. Tom was CFO and pretty much everything at Tell Labs. For a while, and then he's now CEO of West Health Technologies. And we talked for an hour. At the end of it, I said, "What do you do outside of work?" And he said, "I'm really into music, and I run." I said, "Well, but I don't run. But what type of music are you into?" And he said, "Oh, like the Almond Brothers, that type of thing." And I said, "Okay, do you have another hour? Because now we're going to talk about music for a while." And then Rob, Tom and I have been to three concerts together, where we were the by far the youngest people there in the front row. <laughs> and maybe we were the only sober people in the place. But we had a we had a, we had a great time here. We built a real relationship. It was just because I just asked an additional question. What do you do outside of work? So don't be afraid to go to the personal place and talk about your family because that's how we all develop real relationships and real friendships. So is that helpful, Terry? Yep. All right, Richard. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm happy to see you back in Chicago. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to pick up what uh, Janine was saying. Uh, well over 10 years ago, I uh, started to look into networking. I went to a, a FANG meeting, and it, it ended up being the most depressing event in my life. Uh, it was people with handbills and deer in the headlights were up, and they're reading some script about what they're trying to do or whatever. And I was just like, no thanks. So I, I went to a, an FBI meeting, and uh, totally opposite. By the end of the meeting, I'd been volunteered to join a committee by <laughs> Sarah Sulaski, and it kind of went on from there. But uh, it did quite a bit afterward, uh, with many different organizations, just kind of a lot of bandwidth trying to, to see what's, what's going to work, what kind of people I'm going to meet. And, and the key for me was uh, a certain mindset. I mean, there was times where I'd be walking into, uh, you know, the, Chicago social media group or something to do with uh, you know, some other organization. I'm going, why am I, why am I going here? But I have to tell you, that every time I walked away, I came away with something. It is a mindset. I mean, it's walk out into the floor. You know, it's like I don't know a soul. It's like you know, I'm just going to embrace this. I'm going to walk out there. I don't know who the hell you are, but my name's Richard Steele. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, that's really it. I mean, it's really. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to get with it. But really, Terry, maybe to better answer your question, when I sit down with people, I'm not thinking about what I can get out of them. I'm thinking, who in my network do they need to know? And I'll tell you something. I, I, it drives me crazy because I'm always behind on introductions because I have certain Gwen who's sitting here knows this about me because I think I know you more too. Um, I'd anyway. like to offer one more thing. And that's a, one of the things that I was struck by was that it's, it's yes, it's the feedback you get from, from talking to other people, but Oftentimes, I would find myself saying something, and I'd realize that I'm articulating a thought that I didn't know I knew until I said it. Sure. And I found that fascinating. Yeah. So it was just, it's a learning experience, you know, all the way around. It just, to me, you know, when you're in transition, wouldn't it be great 
if you knew when it was going to end, so you could have fun during it. You know? <laughs> I've always thought that. Um, the thing about it is you don't know when it's going to end, and you can only control what you can control. You can't control if somebody else is interviewing, and you, you can't control that. All you can control is, I say you can control the inputs, you can't control the outputs. So the inputs are about activity, 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 and more activity. It is a sales process. But I personally don't want to sell. I want to help my clients to buy well. There's a big difference between the two. It's a mindset, and it's a, it's a, it's a fine line, but they are two very, very different things. And it's the same thing as you're developing relationships with people. It's like, I'm not here for you. I'm here, even though I'm in transition, I'm here for you. What can I do to help you? And people, oh, really? And then you deliver. I, I took a detour a few years ago, and I left this business, and I went to selling um, very differentiated life insurance, wealth preservation type work with my wife's father-in-law. And I met a gentleman, and um, he said, who do you need to know to get to where you want to be? And I told him, I need to meet estate planning attorneys, uh, private equity folks, um, uh, managing partners of law firms, CPA firms, and that Saturday I get 13 introductions from him, and I bet Jack could probably figure out what I'm talking about. Um, 13 introductions um, to all these people that I had asked him to, to meet. And then they start to email me back, oh, Lori says you should, I should meet with you, I, I guess I should meet with you. I'm like, who's this guy? Like, and I went and met with him, he said, Aaron, it's not about what you know, it's really about who you know at some point in your career. You know, because everybody here is, is smart financially or we wouldn't be here, right? But, so it's not about that. It's about how many people do you know and how many people have you helped. And again, that when we're all done with all of this, and you know, I look at my kids and they say, what do you do for a living? I say, I help people. And I really believe that's what I do. And it's pretty cool. So. Any other comments? Yes. What's your name? I'm Joan Nazareth. Hi, nice to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. Um, I just wanted to share a story. You never know when you're doing some long-range interviewing because the way I got my present position is actually through another FEI member who relocated out to the East Coast very quickly, like within the space of about two weeks. And she literally called me one day and said, gee, I'm leaving. How would you like to come interview for my job? I think you'd get along well with my company's owner. And she was somebody I had known for you know a few years. We had a similar industry background and things like that. So it's sort of funny how how things That's work sometimes. It's, it's just it's and you're happy unexpected. I've been there. I was counting today. It's coming up to five years. So I guess I'm coming up to the end of my tenure. <laughs> <based on. laughs> but the thing about it is that I, I think a lot. A big part of the reason for that is people wind up in roles that they're not necessarily right for, or people move around, or you know. So when people move around, it's like maybe you got along, but now it's not going to work because there's a there's you know, it's like the people you're working with and for aren't necessarily in concert with you and your values and all those other things. But when you find that, that's where the magic happens. You know, and I mean, I again, I um, I spent four months getting to know Baker Tiller before I joined. Thankfully, I had the opportunity to do that. They were they were great, very gracious about that. So they told me a lot about the firm. And I am um, I jump out of bed in the morning except when I'm talking. My daughter's having something. But other than that, I mean, I really do. I, I love what I do, and I want everybody here to feel the same way because we all deserve it. So that's as tough a feeling as I can get. That's true. Anybody else? And again, please feel free to follow up with me through LinkedIn tonight. I'll be here till probably about five thirty because my son is um, starting in Mary Poppins at Island Park tonight, so I have to go up there for that. But again, I'm looking forward to getting to know everybody here, and um, again, I appreciate you know the opportunity to present.